I'm Blake Hargreaves, and this is Future Stops. This is the sound of Berlin, April 2020. It's the peak of the coronavirus lockdown, and American organist Cameron Carpenter is performing live for hundreds of people. How is this possible during confinement, you may wonder? Is this pandemic concert a flagrant violation of the law and social graces? Or some misguided act of civil disobedience from an organist known for his irreverent and rebellious style? No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Cameron Carpenter is the superstar organist of our time and creator of the International Touring Organ, a digital instrument requiring a road crew and speaker system which rivals that of your favorite stadium heavy metal band. For years, this Grammy-nominated Juilliard graduate's reputation has grown as a performer, playing the most prestigious venues around the world for an increasingly dedicated fan base. But of course, all of that came to a halt in March of this year. In response, Carpenter took to the streets of Germany to perform for a very different and much broader public. Today on Future Stops, we visit Cameron Carpenter's studio in Berlin and speak to him about his experiences performing public organ concerts on the back of a flatbed truck. Um, well, the idea wasn't actually mine. It was, it, it was the idea of a close friend of mine here in, in Berlin named Christian Reichert, who's a dramaturg and a musical producer. What, do you, what would you think about putting a small organ on a truck? We could take it around. And I immediately thought of Bach, and I thought, yeah, I can see that would work. And we kind of just workshopped the idea and developed it into what it became. So basically, we did, uh, we did 32 concerts in four days in Berlin. That was the first stage. And then we did 40 concerts in eight days as the second stage. And that was all over Germany. And uh, just because, uh, you know, it was just kind of a product of, of circumstances, really. I mean, I wanted to be playing and I, I was, you know, facing the entire cancellation of uh, two, basically, concert seasons. So, of course, I was concerned about... Uh, trying to do anything to generate income through playing. And um, there was a great, just a really lucky sort of synergy that allowed that to happen. Um, and so it, it just kind of took off and uh, it was an enormous amount of, of work, but it was uh, incredibly satisfying. Some of the playing that we did here in Berlin and some of the, some of, between the two tours, um, I had some of the playing experiences of a lifetime, definitely. There were several days where I was probably the only musician, one of them, playing in Europe in any way, I guess. Um, and certainly at that level, you know, I was, I was playing on television and radio and for live audiences at a point at which it was becoming clear that the live audience might be gone. And so that was really, yeah, that was really noteworthy in some way. Um, and it was also a great example of what can be very good for a musician, which is to just be thrown into something where you're just thrown into the emergency situation and you just do it. Whether it's eight performances a day or whatever, you just, you just make the music right then because that's when it needs to be made. And that is not necessarily where the most careful playing occurs, but it is some of the most passionate playing. And like I said, some of those experiences I had on the truck were absolutely the playing experiences of my life, and not just once or twice. I mean, we did a total of, I guess, 73 concerts between the two tours, and I would say at least 20 of those were high watermark emotional playing experiences for me personally, far beyond anything I had experienced. It's not to put down Royal Albert Hall or the Berlin Philharmonie or a Disney Hall or Tchaikovsky Hall in Moscow or Suntory Hall or Melbourne Town Hall or the Sydney Opera House or these places that I've played. I've had life affirming experiences in all of those venues and it's been amazing to play there and I hope I can do it again. But there was something about playing on the truck that surpassed those experiences. Who would have thought 
playing for 20 people on the back of a truck on the Viscount organ. Um, but that's the truth. So was the truck just a normal truck, or was it, like, did you have to customize in a whole bunch of crazy ways? We did customize a bit. It's, it's not what I would call a normal truck. It's what's called a curtain cider. So it is a truck that's designed for presentation in some way. Sometimes, it's, sometimes they use curtain cider trucks for transporting um, precious automobiles, historic cars and stuff. Um, the benefit of that is that we were able to build the whole stage build. So the console and the lighting truck, truss, mixing desk, uh, and amplifiers for the sound system. And then the sound system itself, which was on you know two big clusters on either side of me, plus stage monitors. Um, that was all built onto the truck first. And then the, the, it was a little more complicated than this. But basically, the curtain can be pulled back, tied back. Everything's connected and unstrapped, and there are supporting, you know, bars in there that have to be taken away. But the whole thing can be set up in about 15 minutes and broken down in about 10. But, um, but there wasn't any real customization that needed to be done to the truck itself. It was just a matter of having, you know, what, what the equipment is that's done on the build. And the quality of equipment makes a huge difference. You need a extreme, an extremely high uh, quality sound system. Playing on a truck um, is not playing at Carnegie Hall. It's, it's not that, I mean, actually, I did some of my best playing on the truck, and I put an enormous effort into it, but it wasn't necessary to present a show. It was, um, the, the, the focus was on trying to get good sound and also trying to have a visual presentation that would be self-intelligible so that people could see, ah, it's an organ on a truck. It, there, there didn't need to be an explanation for what it was. Um, and that, you know, having that kind of, those priorities in place kind of took care of everything else. Because then you just go up and play Bach, and Bach does all the work, of course. Um, so it was, it, it, it was kind of a way of, of moving a little bit away from the presentations that I had done and just doing a more simple kind of approach. This initial success led to more and more of these outdoor performances, culminating in a series across Germany, where Carpenter has lived for the last 10 years. The experience was simply extraordinary. I mean, from, there was one day in Berlin where we played at a, um, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is a huge 19th century hospital complex here, which was a corona hospital. And... Um, then we played at a hospice environment where there were about 10 people listening who it was not only almost certainly the last music they would ever hear, but maybe the last thing that they ever did as a group. Um, and that was took place in a little sort of sylvan clearing out in the woods, amazingly. That was an incredible experience. And I just played uh, some of the Goldberg variations for them. And then... Uh, I think it was on the same day we had a, uh, a setting in Lichtenberg, which is a center in Berlin where there are enormous, huge tower housing blocks that go on for miles. Um, and we had, everybody was inside. They were all quarantined. So we were playing in this open square at, you know, 120 dB uh, with earplugs, playing with earplugs and monitors. And the organ was heard for, you know, uh, six or seven kilometers and by thousands of people. So, I mean, it was, it was just a day of uh, experience of contrast every time. And the, the truck tour through Germany took us not to the major cultural centers where I would already have played with the touring organ in past years, but mostly to small, out-of-the-way uh, 
boroughs all over Germany, some of which were um, there. There was a more of a focus on that second trip on playing for disabled people. So there were a lot of mentally disabled and like physically disabled group homes and stuff that we played for. It was just a fantastic experience. Um, there were places where people were, where <laughs> there was one amazing place where, uh, which is called Lebenshilfe um, in Rinteln, Germany, which is an, a, an enormous uh, a, a campus, which is mostly dedicated to people with different disabilities. Um, and we played uh, an outdoor concert there for about 200 of them. And as the organ was being set up and they were being, most of them in wheelchairs or with assistance, were being brought in, a lot of these people were simply vocalizing like crazy. And the moment the organ started to play, everybody was totally silent. And they listened like it was the music for Ryan. It was amazing. A little uncanny, actually. So um, I tend not to be one of those musicians who expounds at, at, uh, at length about... Uh, the universal benefits of music and so on, but it was kind of it was kind of sobering to see um, people at least be able to, if not connect, at least um, assemble and uh, and sort of have a, a moment to themselves. Um, and you know, because of music, and undoubtedly without necessarily understanding all the music that they were hearing, but that wasn't necessarily you know relevant. So it was. It was a very different experience to playing in the concert hall. And it was a different experience playing-wise in terms of what I needed to do to make the music work. It was a great example of how playing under duress, in a way, can be creative too. There was a concert we played for a housing block in East, East Berlin where there was a torrential downpour during the entire concert. It sounded great because, of course, the, the humid air just picked up the music even better. And there was even a rainbow at the end. People were on their balconies and out with umbrellas. I thought we would have nobody. We had tons of people at that concert. And the fact that it was happening in the rain was almost, almost added to it. So there were just special experiences like that where you almost didn't know if you know you were really going to get through it because the rain was literally at my back. The organ was kind of getting wet, actually, um, but we just did it anyway. And so there's you know there's a certain there's a certain adventure aspect to it where you have to be prepared to accept people where they are as they are, um, and the the trade off is that you hope that they'll accept you and what you're doing, which is totally alien that you're showing up with a truck, driving into their backyard and playing an hour-long concert or whatever, um, that they maybe didn't ask for also. So, you know, there's, there's, there's also, you always got to remember that, 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 that just because it's music and we love it doesn't mean that other people want to hear it. And when you have music that's being projected outside, no one can unhear it. We don't have evolutional ear flaps that cover our ears when we don't want to, you know, we can close our eyes, but not our ears. And so you have to, you're, you're, you're on thin ice in a way because you, you know, it's dangerous to assume that everybody who will hear you wants to hear music. Um, and we, we didn't have exactly protests, but we, we de did have some places where we had difficult interactions with people in the area who, yeah, who, who objected to our being there. And so, you know, that was, that was, quickly quashed by the police that were with us and that's something I have mixed feelings about but um, it does happen and so it's, it just it just bears remembering that not everybody shares our enthusiasm for not only music but especially organ music um, there was one place we played. It wasn't exactly for homeless, but it was a kind of a halfway house um, type of retreat. We had a lot of people with addiction problems, psychological problems, and people who were essentially destitute, what you and I would think of as destitute. And uh, we took the organ truck there and played for those people. 
And um, there were police there, partly because it's not a particularly safe place, and also, I think, because it was anticipated that it might somehow not be well received or well thought of and that it wouldn't go well. But it actually did go well, and not only did it go well, it just, I just felt a very deep um, yeah, resonance playing there. Um, it's not necessarily to say that it, was, that, that it was because what I was playing was understood or whatever. I actually have played for enough people that I no longer really give a damn about that. It's, it's not appropriate to expect an audience to, ex to, ex to uh, deeply understand from first hearing a Bach chorale prelude or the intense counterpoint or whatever. Uh, your job as a performer is not necessarily to educate them about the structure of counterpoint. It's to give them an emotional result and an impact. And ultimately, um, what I've always said and told audiences, um, felt I felt was quite well proven in this exercise, which is that there is no authority except the individual listener. Each individual listener will decide what the performance, the music, the musician, the whole thing means to them. You have no control over that. You have no authority at all as a performer over that. The only authority you can exercise is to deliver uh, an honestly rendered and well-prepared performance to the best of how you feel it can be done. So that some, of, some of the places where I say it was a high watermark for me personally playing doesn't mean that I'd want to go back and listen to a recording of that playing. We're playing outside and in, at a decibel level that can be heard literally for several kilometers. So I'm having an experience which is a larger scale experience than I'll ever have on any other organ. I know that as I begin. Um, and I'm playing Bach. And as you can hear outside of the sound system, even though I have earplugs on, and even though I'm playing through monitors, and I'm behind the field of sound, which like these giant cannons are then rocketing the sound out, um, you know, to buildings in the distance, and it's echoing off these buildings to other buildings and can be heard at a distance. And you can see on Instagram and Facebook, people um, would share their stories from the buildings, and sometimes at a distance. It's an incredibly phenomenal sound. It sounds a lot like a giant organ and a huge acoustic being sound played at a distance. You know, as I was playing that, I felt as though I was playing on some kind of fantasy organ that was you know, exponentially larger than any other organ we could ever imagine and was somehow up in the sky. I mean, it was a, almost a surreal experience. Um, and so there, you know, those, th b by definition, I was having an experience I couldn't have with a pipe organ. Um, and so I, so it was, it was a rare and, and unique um, playing experience and probably one that was, if not ever hadn't been had by, by anyone before, was, was, was quite rare to have as a player.
You're listening to the Future Stops podcast, an initiative of the Royal Canadian College of Organists. My name is Blake Hargreaves, and I'm your host as we explore the world of the 21st century organ. We just heard today's feature performance, an excerpt from Bach's Prelude in A Major by Cameron Carpenter, who's playing in a public park in Eberswald, Germany, in July of this year. The recital is part of a series of concerts for the confined playing an electronic pipe organ on the back of a flatbed truck. These pandemic-provoked public performances were his response to the difficult reality of having his international touring schedule cancelled. He chose to take this challenge and turn it into an opportunity to help others without realizing how much the experience would affect him. I hate to sound selfish about it, but I suspect that may, maybe in, in some ways I got the most out of it. I, I hope not, but I just know that I did grow a lot as a performer because it, it's always good as a performer to, to find yourself pushed into different situations. That's actually what the, the pipe organ purists always say. Um, how can you turn away from the pipe organ? Don't you, know, don't you miss the experience of each pipe organ being different? But of course I do. That's what we love about the pipe organs, that each one is, we we have a relationship, a new relationship with each instrument. The problem is that on a large scale, that's just not compatible with 21st century musical commerce. It's not compatible with branding. You may or may not like it, but music is an entertainment and it is sold as such. And an organ is an organ to the audience. They're not there to worry on your behalf about whether you're able to execute what they paid to hear on the organ they happen to have. That's not their fault. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the organ truck is, is in line with all of that experience in that it thrust me into a situation where, again, I was, you know, I needed to adapt to changing circumstances. Uh, when you're playing on the truck, do you ever play sort of sacred music? And if you do, what is the experience like of taking that music outside of a church and really putting it in front of a public that includes everyone? I mean, I don't generally play much sacred music, period. The, the closest I get to sacred music is occasionally playing, for instance, some of the larger Leipzig chorales. So the first one, the um, Komm Heiliger Geist Fantasy in F major, that I did play on the truck quite a bit. And a couple of, uh, there were a couple of short orgelbuchlein that were played. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it's, it's not really comparable as an experience for me to playing in a, in a church because I don't, I don't have a context for playing it in church. Um, but uh, as music qua music, it was, um, it was great. It was well received. And particularly here in Germany, I mean, this is the country of Bach or the land of Bach, you'd say. So um, it was, you know, it, it felt basically right. And actually, it, 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 I'm not, I wasn't, and I'm, I'm still not really concerned with the religious side of box music. It's, it's sort of there, and my attitude to it is that it's integral to the music, and there's, in a way, nothing that can be done about it. Um, <laughs> not that nothing, and perhaps nothing needs to be done about it. It just is what it is. Um, but it's not particularly relevant to me, but uh, what is relevant and what is, to me, always much more interesting than the, the, the religious context in music, uh, in box music, is um, the, the deep logic and the hierarchical structure of it. I'm sure a theologian or a, a traditionally minded Bach interpreter would say that that is a reflection of the structure of God or, or of Bach's uh, reverence for God. That may all be so. But all of that exists whether there are words attached to it or not. So it seems to me independent from that. And it's the, um, you know, if, if those people in, in, at Lebenshilfe in Rentlum, Germany, that, um, that home for the disabled where I was playing and they were all so attentive, they weren't attentive because of some garbage words that Martin Luther dreamt up, you know. And they weren't attentive because of some blood philosophy that was, you know, that, that um, tarnishes whatever a chorale prelude is unfortunate enough to have parasitically attached itself to. That's not what was magnetizing those people, and that's not what they were responding to. I'm quite sure of that, because there would have been no way for them to know that those words were attached to those melodies. Perhaps one or two of those people, if they spent their lives in the Lutheran church, might be remotely aware if they were particularly musically sensitive and happened to remember it. 
that the fundamental tune of that F major piece that I was playing was actually attached to the words Kom Heiliger Geist, but I doubt it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, it just goes to show that music is generally, um, if not superior to, above the matter of the literality of language. Um, thank heavens, when you see some of the literal, some of the language that box music is attached to, um, you know, you don't really want to have anything to do with it. I don't. Uh, but the music is, you know, it, it, uh, outlasts that. I can imagine that for those in pandemic lockdown, the deep logic of Bach's music was reflected in a very contemporary way by the sight of a truck pulling up and the sides coming off to reveal a huge speaker array, filling the air with the music of this intrepid young performer at over 120 decibels, resonating through the empty streets of the composer's homeland. In our search for quintessential 21st century organ experiences, here on the Future Stops podcast, Cameron Carpenter's Organ Truck Concerts for the Confined fits the bill perfectly. If you have a contemporary pipe organ experience you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear about it. We're on Facebook and Instagram as Future Stops Podcast, where we're continuing the conversation and sharing photos and information about our upcoming episodes. Future Stops is a podcast from the Royal Canadian College of Organists, Produced by Andrew O'Connor, with Haley Raymond as community manager and executive producer Elizabeth Shannon. I'm Blake Hargreaves reminding you to pull the subscribe stop and join us next time. Thanks for listening.